Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Good Times Hour. All right, D, take it away. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world, please rise and welcome to the tea, our very next special guest in this great series on the pioneer women of disc golf. She's the OG with the B, the deputy supervisor at Frisbee Hill, the thrill from Rochester who got the best of the crowd at the WFC two years in a row so many years ago. She's the free spirit with Frisbee style who always played with passion and never any guile. Indoor flights and summertime Frisbee nights shape this admin biz into the disc golf whiz. It's a breeze to make the call. She may be a self-described old geezer, but she still got it all when it comes to the game we play. From beat pre-basket days to, and pre-bevel plays to the turning of the wheel from Frisbee to disc, she has been present to represent the passing of the lamp from champ to champ. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome and from Tar Hill State, the great Michelle Marini. Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, what a talent you are to pull, weave that together. And <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't ever uh, read through it. Well, actually, he hasn't included it the last couple of times just because I don't read it. And I, I always like to just see the surprise look on the person's face when, oh, oh, wow, where did he find that? You know? Yeah, I was like, hmm, indoor. Yeah, I heard that one. <laughs> Unknown indoor fact, yes. Well, let's, uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for taking the time to join us today. Um, you know, this is a really special and important thing within the thing that we're doing, doing this Pioneer series or series on Pioneer Women of Disc Golf. Um, <laughs> and so let's just jump in, Mace, what you set it up there. And just uh, tell the people. Yeah, right, right on. All right. So framework, uh, we're here today with Michelle Marini. Her PDJ number is 303. Um, you're originally from Rochester, New York, and now you're hailing from Hillsboro, North Carolina, which is near Raleigh. Um, global master series rank is number 11 in women 65 through 69. Um, you have, um, you threw MTA, uh, 8.5 seconds in Cedar Falls, Iowa, April 26, 1981. Indoor. Oh, that was indoor. What's that? In a huge dome you know on the on the campus and that record still stands today ah, awesome nice who, who's hosted an indoor maximum time a lot <laughs> yep. well we're gonna we're gonna i got some specific questions that i just realized when we talked to cheryl newland we'll talk about that uh, later on today but it's yeah who does who gets to do things like that i mean like it's it's interesting and you know we'll talk about this too later but that you know what you told me about yesterday about um jim having access to the to the gym at the school that he taught at and that's where you tune up your skills and you know like people down here where i live they don't think about that kind of thing like what do you mean why would i need to throw inside i mean you just wait a day or two and it's going to be beautiful around here so you plan indoor events and that's how my mom and dad met each other was bowling and in indoor winter sports so oh, wow. that's yeah and that's so cool so jim yeah jim palmary started the rochester frisbee club um probably i'm not I, I can't remember the exact date but i mean he started it late 60s early 70s and then hosted a couple little golf tournaments on his own local and then um, finally um, had the big one in 1974, the first um, American Flying Disc Open. And uh, so he's, you know, yeah. Rock that's pretty show. amazing. And it's still rolling with 50 years later. Years. And, and that's one thing that's really been cool in the last few weeks with us too, because we talked to Susie Horn a couple of weeks ago and, you know, their event's at 45 now. And, you know, I'm about to, I just sanctioned my event for the 23rd. And so I'm way behind y'all, you know, and I feel like I've done a lot, but, but, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, it's just, you know, I'm halfway there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, again, Jim, he was just a pioneer. He was a fourth thinker. He loved every type of sport. He was a runner. He was a gymnast. And he, when Frisbee came along and he saw just such a great combination of different skill levels that you could incorporate into golf into distance into accuracy into maximum time aloft into freestyle he just um jumped on the bandwagon and just took it to new heights and again was such a great organizer motivator 
and he had the van. He had the wheels to get everyone. Nice, <laughs> right, right. Oh, and that's gonna come up again. That's gonna come up again later as well. Yeah. So you were a two-time world frisbee golf champion in '79 and '80, as well as a world frisbee distance champion in 1980. Yeah. And where where did those where did you play those two championships at the '79 and the '80? So that was at Whammo's World Championships at the Rose Bowl. Oh, and, cool. Yep. So from in 76, when Whammo then started their premier events to then crown an overall champion, you would have to uh, qualify by attending what they call the NAS, North American Series. And it was overall events at individual tournaments throughout the country. You had to accumulate points in order to qualify to get to Whammo's World Championships. And then your your trip is all paid, even your airfare coming from, you know, East Coast. That's my, awesome. Nothing on a plane for me to have that opportunity to travel. Same with David. Jim Palmieri went. Doug Correa went. Um, Jamie Moult, probably second or third year. But, um, yeah, we had a good contingent from Rochester. But those, yeah. two, those two years that you won golf, uh-huh. I know the Rose Bowl was there just as the finals on Sunday for the big, you know, showcase sports. Exactly. But right. golf, you had to play off, the, off campus, basically. Right. right. Um, and what, it's and not sometimes it was, it was, was it always Irvine? It wasn't always. I guess it depended on, I think, I remember Irvine in 80, 79, but I remember back in 76 and 78 playing Oak Grove. And then um, there might have been another one to us. I just don't remember where, but yes, we would do our one or two rounds of qualifying. And then the finals would be cut to whatever, maybe eight or four ladies. And then you're tag teaming or kind of somebody that group's going off to finish MTA. But, you know, here you got to be here now. But if you were still in one of the other finals, it's like, ooh, quick, I got to finish here because I got to get over there. Okay. At least if they ha- had it on the one campus like they did with Irvine, you could get from one location to the other um, to where the field events were versus the um, Frisbee golf course they had right on the campus. And So in, in those situations, was it since a lot of that stuff was based on time, were mm-hmm. they flexible, if you know, to allow you to be able to complete what you were doing at another uh, in another event? Yeah, on the other part it. of the field, or they, there wasn't a bunch of rigidity back then, was there? No, Everybody was no, like, no, no, go get it taken care of, and we'll have time for you here, too. Very flexible, and if it went a little bit longer, you just kind of let the officials know, hey, I got to be over there, because they're going to start this second round, but I need to finish up here at distance, so can I go first? You know, simple things like that, and just get it out of the way. And they were, um, but yet, Whammo, every morning, you'd re- go to breakfast at the big cafeteria, and you had your uh, uh, agenda and your itinerary, where you needed to be if you were in this round, if you qualified for that, where the prelims, where the semis, where the finals were going to be. So they logistically had it really well done. Well, all the players. That was, Stork was doing so much of that, not getting any sleep. Yes, 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 sleepless nights. And then the publications, again, with that agenda, your itinerary, it had all the results from the previous day. So somebody was staying up late, and it was, you know, not photocopying. I wonder if it was mimeograph. Yeah, probably <laughs> was. The machine. With, the old, with the old blue ink and everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that kind of uh, chemical activity. A lot, of hard, stay up at night. a lot of hours. Yeah, eating a lot of bad food, staying up all night, and sniffing mimeographs. Man, that's not a combo. <laughs> it's, 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 well, I don't know. He's still with us, so I guess it probably didn't hurt him too much. So your PDGA number, this is something that we always – we always get a kick out of because there's lots of different tie-ins, you know, and like yours is going to be similar to some of the times that I, I've seen happen at my events. Cause I used to run the early events in the DFW area. So I was getting everybody's renewals or their new, new right. lineups, but we always ask, okay, so where was it that you got your number and what were the circumstances that led to it? So go ahead and tell us that story. Okay, so in 1977, we went to the Octad, which was um, down in Rutgers, New Jersey, and um, that was a big overall event, Octad, eight events, so you could pick and choose if you wanted to do as many as you wanted or just fine-tune it. David, my husband, would kind of fine-tune it and just do freestyle and maybe TRC, MTA. Um, So we did that tournament over the weekend, and it was Memorial Day weekend, and then on that Monday it was at Craigmere 
And that was a now a new official PDGA golf only event. So, so it was on a Monday. So we all left um, the Octad and then drove, I don't know how far, but it was still in New Jersey. So it was still on the East Coast. And everyone arrived, whatever time, nine, between nine, 930 registration. So you're in line to register for this event and pay your PDGA fee, get your PDGA number and register for the tournament. And so uh, my husband, because he had the pocketbook, well, <laughs> the money, he's 302, I'm 303. He paid for both of us. Doug Korea is 304. He was standing behind us. And then the subsequent, you know, now the PDGA numbers are in the 300s because I heard there was the same weekend more on the West Coast, a PDGA event as well. So how they take team distributing the numbers, I don't know if maybe theirs was on the Saturday before ours on a Monday. That could have been. Yeah, I mean, you're right. You could have. That, he was that's all preoccupied. It wanted to do the octad um, in in Rutgers, and um, again that tournament was established by Stork and Gary Siebert and Irv Call and the guys that came out of um, you know that area of New Jersey, and um, that's Jens and Irwin are New Jersey guys and started, you know, free sound, but they did all the events as well. And there was a smaller women's contingent, but, you know, I'd compete with maybe 10 to 15 women. Um, so my competition <laughs> wasn't as, as tight as, you know, guys competing against 200 in a few yeah. offers or, you know, uh, the other events and stuff like that. So, but then, so we did get to know each other uh, better because we were, you know, constantly paired or mixed up and went to do this event and this event, you know, so they had, you know, at least a women's division for everything back then. And um, thank you, Cheryl Horn, or Cheryl, Cheryl Horn, Cheryl Newland Payne. Right. <laughs> yeah. Cheryl, Cheryl was great. She had a lot of great stories about, you know, raising her voice and, and definitely, yeah getting things organized and, and counted on. But let's talk about you and let's go back to your, your origin story. I know um, Mace Man had talked to you and gave me the notes, so I didn't actually find this anywhere, but your first date, and you guys are still married. We saw him before we started recording um, to Dave Marini, was in uh, February of 1974. 74. So on February 16th, we will, have, we will celebrate our 50th anniversary of our first date. Wow. We knew each other since seventh grade, same school district. So we were longtime friends, common friends, and but didn't start dating until college. So, um, yep, we come up with our 50th anniversary, then dated the three years and were married in 1977. So my first years of competition was my maiden name, Michelle Harrington. Uh, during 75, when we went to a few tournaments, Dave was competing. I was spectating and then we were married in may of 77 and um so then as a 77 all my my name changed to michelle marini so um i know that you had started playing frisbee in july of 74 is that where you discovered frisbee sports is that like the first because you frisbee was in the zeitgeist before that right no it was um just a fun thing to do and again in the summer months You'd find the parking lots that were lit, which were a lot of church parking lots, and you could go play. Um, you know, it was cooler in the night, and Dave had a couple other buddies. He played a lot, and then they, you know, I'd get out there and start throwing. And I just came across a picture of us. We went camping in '74, and I, I'm playing frisbee and catching a, a, a master, right? The, the big oldies, you know, right. under under the lake catch. So I started. Uh throw and you know we just had fun on the beach and um but in 74 david attended that first american flying disc open because it was on the college he attended it was on the college grounds st john fisher college where he attended there's a bad, so uh, Mary, bad resolution went to a uh, yeah the local Mazda dealer got this car as the um prize stork competed in the ddc event and the golf everybody did david would have competed in both events as well but because of the accumulative scoring of the two events stork came out ahead and took first place and won the car so wow so travel was, across the country organize the event and then win it <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so jim Palmieri paid on that little car loan for <laughs> quite a few years after that. Oh. He said it was, oh. 
She was right. at a secret. I revealed, but he said it was the best investment he ever did because he knew the sport and the popularity had potential. And so he wanted to show that big, you know, sponsorships, come on and get on board. It, it's, you know, it's worth it for their exposure and to have the big prizes to draw the players. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. fighting a TD like in a way that I never even considered. Yeah. Yeah. Jim was again, a pioneer and, and forethinker of, you know, promoting and, and popularizing this sport and he did a great job. So that well, was 74. It, it, so David what? attended that and I didn't get to attend I, my <laughs> funny story. I went to watch the afternoon events, but a big rainstorm came in. So I left, but that rainstorm kind of put a bunch of water on an underpass and my car stalled in the underpass. I had to call my dad and get, get out of there. I must have wet the carburetor. I don't know, damp water into the carburetor, but I got home okay. And then, yeah, he would have gone back for the Sunday. I didn't go on Sunday. So that was August of 74. So again, all that winter now, he's met um, Jim Palmieri and some other people in Rochester. And Jim was a teacher. We went indoors. Uh, he taught at Penfield High. So he was able to get us free gym time, like on a Friday night, Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon. And that's when everybody would kind of do freestyle. And then maybe couldn't do a whole lot of other things indoors, but, you know, just hang out and, and even to just, you know, spin the disc yourself and practice your tipping and practice you know, throwing, um, you know, we just did that and then we'd go out and hang out. And that was all that winter of 74. Right. So 75 comes around and David knows from Jim that in order to qualify for, again, the Rose Bowl, Whammo's championship, you had to pass the master's test. And um, he did not, there wasn't a qualifying tournament or, or I guess you, if you passed your master's test and just, paid your own way to get there. They would allow you to compete, but there were others that were invited. And um, so he went with Jim Palmieri. They picked up Jeff Hungerford in Boulder, Colorado. Jim's brother, John Palmieri was in the van and one other person, oh, this friend Woody, just a local friend from Rochester. And they drove from Rochester to Southern California. Wow, awesome. Rose Bowl in 75. So and that's a good question. I wanted to ask you, when he came back, was he, Enthused, pumped up, inspired. Oh, on fire, yeah, because now he's again seeing the freestyle. And um, Doug Korea, another competitor, a um, guy from Rochester, yeah. was starting. We know Doug. He was a great player, tricks, catch, trick throw. So Dave and and um, Doug partnered up again as a 75 and into again into that winter season from 75 going into 76 practice and now they're getting you know they're seeing other freestylers now they're incorporating the trick catch trick throw uh fine-tuning their skill and then in 76 broke on the scene is a, a very high competitive freestyle pair in 76 and it, a lot of times it was in the first they were in the top three and a lot of them with jens and erwin uh, velasquez nice. uh, on the east yeah. coast nice now before we get too far i uh I already talked to you a little bit about this. You had a great interview with Scott Stokely and you're talking about uh, 75. Mm -hmm. Your first event that you went to travel to, you didn't play, but you witnessed was the venerable IFT, uh, mm -hmm. most likely the first and longest running tournament in the world, Thank Disney you. tournament. Um, and it was there that Dave really chose the freestyle events and you really kind of grabbed to it for the field events. Right, right. But I, I love this story about you watching Monica Luke. Can you talk and expand on that? So the guys were, they all, I got to show you real quick. This is probably Dave's t-shirt from 1975, playing with Jim Palmieri, this friend, yes. Lee, Doug Korea, John Palmieri, Jim's brother. This was the their Guts team. So Guts was the big event there. And so I'm just looking, I'm a spectator and they have this demo and it's like, ooh, Wow, look at that girl throw. And if they introduced her as Monica Lou, the current world champion, because she must have won it in 75. Right. Maybe 74. You can go back 74. But she was the premier distance thrower all through early 75. So she was there, did a distance demo, and it's like, wow, how does she do that? Well, then they had a little, what would you call it? Um, oh, step up and try. Try your, you know, have a fling in a throwing distance. And I tried it and I realized, whoa, there's skill involved and I don't have it. So 
just that again, road trip with Jim Palmieri in his um, VW van. So we drive up to that tournament for the weekend, 4th of July weekend, drive back home. And um, so now that's July of 75. And then we hear about the Toronto tournament in early, um, probably first or second weekend of August of 75. And that's where I got my first Frisbee t-shirt. Nice. Uh, who, who were the Frisbee freaks? The women's guts play are my team. And guess who was my team captain? Gail McCall, Carolyn McCrory, Carolyn's sister, Catherine, all from Toronto. And I do not remember who our fifth was, but because the team out of Michigan, which would have been Joe Cahow and some other women from the humbly magnificent, this group, because we went to their tournament one year. Oh, wow. Humbly magnificent. Is that what that says? Yeah. So they were out of Ann Arbor. They were at that tournament, had a guts team. And so I played on my first women's guts event in July, whatever the August is 75. Wow. And then Jim would have hosted his second American flying disc open one or two weekends later, again, big golf and DDC. And I might have, I, I, I'd love to find out if I even wanted to try and compete I might have but probably didn't place at all and probably Joe Cahow was there and Gail McCall and Marie Murphy might have come in from Chicago to do this premier golf um, especially but he didn't give away a car that year <laughs> no. I think he gave away a, a bike didn't he um well I know he did in 80 oh no no you you could be right you could be right I, I'm not sure I'll, I'll have to go back and look at the files there's so much just there's just so much data out there people just have to go and look for it or they could just tune into us and listen to our chat. Right, so um, that, August that, I want to ask you, this is a good time to ask you about Gail McCall. Mm -hmm. Could you expand a little bit on Gail or have, do you have a, a Gail story or a memory you want to share with us? Yeah, she, all right, so we met um, at that tournament. Then she would have come to Rochester. We would have gone to Toronto every year because it was close from Rochester and got to know Gail. And then many times um, never played DDC with her, but would have been, all right, off we go to do distance, off we go to do accuracy. But I remember um, she went down to Austin, Texas in 77, and David and I were both there. It was a big um, freestyle event and then probably golf and distance. But Gail, they, they had a race platform stage and they had a strange little ladder to go up to the stage. And so talk about OSHA laws being <laughs> totally neglected. But I remember seeing her walk up this ladder of steps without having to hang on to the rails. But the poise and the balance in her was just like, how did she do that? But her freestyle reflected that. She was just so graceful and, uh, and great. But when she needed the power and, you know, she could place in distance and, of course, MTA and TRC. But I um, saw Gail at many, many tournaments and then had another opportunity one of the summers I want to say 78 or 79 to go out to the um, world championships when we were still hosting. She stayed after the tournament and I, I'm pretty sure we were, it was after, but anyway, she came with us down to San Diego because I had a high school friend there. And so she um, drove with us yeah, down to La Jolla and we just hung out at the beach that day. That trip, they lost her luggage. I went shopping with her because um, she had to go buy, you know, uh, sneakers and an extra pair of shorts. And we used to wear leotards with shorts and, you know, just summer wear. And so I remember going shopping with her. So we got, yeah, forged a good friendship that summer. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's one of the great stories. The great things about this Frisbee fraternity is is the love, the the family, the connections. I still keep this. I mean, many of you probably have it. It's the um when they did uh, it's like a, that's the Jim Kenner and her did um their you know new disc disc craft. This is a teeny little you know medallion you know with uh, disc craft products, Westland, Michigan, out of Westland. Oh. So I still have that. It's did my they? Favorite. I know they started production in, in London. London, you, Ontario. Yeah. Do you yeah. have any any discs from that era? I <laughs> from theirs, probably not. Maybe there's something. Unless was I don't think this was a 
no, that's um, I we have we have tons of sky stylers because that's what David and the majority of the freestylers started playing with after okay getting <laughs> back to the original you know we all started with the pros uh, for many of the field events this was the guts this was the guts disc and then um, because they also then had the super pro your next size um, they there's a tiny little I don't know, it's a raised little bump. The uh, free sellers would shave it off with a razor blade. So they had a smoother surface. Oh, so, yeah. So this was then the three because the master had a real strange indent here, but this was the ultimate disc. And we played ultimate in 76 and, and years on. So then, you know, with Whammo being the main manufacturer, Finally, Discraft came out with um, competition. Oh, then Jan Sobel in West Coast came out with the puppy. Yeah. And so now he's starting to give the golf discs. Of course, I think by then, didn't um, Hedrick already had come out with his um, midnight flyers and everything like that. But right. again, at each world championship, they would crown the champions and they'd get their premier, you know, their names on the discs. And um, so this. Oh, was, nice. So this is Monica Lou, Bruce Kroger, Joe Kahow, and Dave Johnson. So two were the distance championships. The other two were the overall championships. Mm. Yep. So, All right, that's cool. And so yeah. they, so that was for, that was stuff that came out this year for last year's winner. Yes, you would have come out the following year, and then it would come out in multiple colors. This mm. is a misprint. It's off center, but this was my distance disc. You know, the 119s were what we used for distance. And then golf, golf drives were with these 119s. And then when they came out with obviously then the, the 119, then the 141, how they nestled nicely. Um, then yeah. It, you know, you had, oh, maybe I'd use this because I need a little more weight. There's too much headwind. And you could use the 141. And then, of course, Hedrick, uh, yeah, came out with now the midnight flyers for plastic, and then this was so this was seventy seven. Do you know Paul what year they started the? I I think it was. Uh, shoot, I got to look that up. Seventy seven sounds right. Like that. That's yeah. a good question. So it's the the night flyer, no ring, but then the midnight right. First it was the night flyer, no mid. Okay. Then it became the midnight flyer. Then it came out with the I don't know why this ring. Um, so now we've got a better plastic because the day glow plastic gave more weight right. and better into the wind, better distance. And but we, it was still a great flying disc that you could curve by the really what, what was the number? What did the number signify then? Nothing. They just usually fit them one to eight. And then it's just because everybody was using these. It just a real quick. Oh, no, I was the number two. I'm going to go check that number two. Oh, no, no, you that's your number two over there. Oh, okay. Identifying, easy identifying, but then you still marked it up anyway. You know, that's why I got all this green around it because I could see it from a distance. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. All right. It's interesting, right. you know, when when you when you think about it, it unless you were there, unless you you know it, the World Frisbee Championships were limited to just whammo discs, right. and so you've got all of a sudden around this. Well, starting with Ed's uh, PDGA. Right. Um, and then you had uh, in 78 Santa Cruz with the world flying uh, disc championships. It oh, would open yeah. up to all types. There you go. <laughs> so yeah. you could use anything that you wanted at these discs, at these places. And sometimes the that was that Cleveland. only started at the Santa Cruz. Was uh, that the Santa Cruz the first go around with that? Or was that, was I guess that had something to do with Whammo being purchased and then them pulling out, basically? Yeah. So that, no, so that was before that. That was in 78 when that started. Okay, but this was this was eighty because I know okay. yeah date on it. But again, now Dave's premier sport is freestyle, so he would go out so he compete in this. But I said, oh, they got golf. I'll do golf, and I I won it. So, <laughs> but, of course nice. you did. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, just with whatever was in our arsenal, you know, we would use. But I had my favorite disc. I have to show you during the um. 76 to 80, when we did the North American series, they would take, um, put someone on 
a logo disc. So this was my husband. Oh, look at that. He, in 78. Wow. Yeah. So that he was 78. And then you've seen the Joe K. How. Yeah. Was, Tina gave us each one of those. Yeah. But Dave was, yeah, featured on, on the disc. So when you went to Whammo's events, you signed all kinds of releases for any photography taken. And so then they were able to use any likeness of you wherever they wanted for promotional. Well, this is good. Uh, good segue. They should have licensed oh, this promotional. Okay. Yeah. Look at, look at that focus. Look at that intensity. Ready to set another record. <laughs> and, yeah. Am I wrong or is that Dave right there? That's Dave. That's Dave. They yeah. were all rocking the luscious curls, weren't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's 78. But anyway, yeah, got the, all my shirts. I dug them out because they would give you the uniform. So. Okay. Oh, okay. Then 77, then 78, there's the logo. So 79, back to familiar color. Oh, now we have High C as a, a little sponsor. And then um, 80, now we've got, yeah, US. Oh, yeah, yeah kind of on there. The US team. Yeah, and then um, I didn't go 81, and then 82 is when it went to New Jersey and um, was Mazda sponsored and um so again they i'm pretty sure yeah by 80 those later 80 82s they did allow you to use other golf discs discs even though it was their tournament they, they realized just let use what you want <clears throat> and um yep so that's well their name was their name was plastered all over the event too though so i mean it really didn't matter what you were throwing right no not by then no, I don't think so they let's uh let's let's jump in with you know, we talk about the Rose Bowl, we talk about the NAS, we talk about these meets. Mm -hmm. Many of them are not all of them are, are complete overalls. The world the World Frisbee Championships obviously are, but you've got some events that are just like like you say, guts and freestyle or DDC and distance or things like that. But uh Mace, why don't you jump in here with the uh just talk, talking about the whole idea of overall events. Well, so and, and I got a I got a pretty good question for this here in a minute, but the overall events basically, you know, were covered MTA, TRC, self caught flight, accuracy, distance, golf, guts, freestyle. But um which which ones did you favor and which ones did you not favor? Which ones were you good at and which ones were you not so good at? Um I guess I held my own in TRC and MTA. Um, which were, you know, the flight, self-caught flight events. Um, and, you know, ended up doing really well in 1980 at, at that one indoor event. But I, I liked accuracy and distance. But the neat thing is to have to go and practice on off days or nights when you know you're going to be attending a tournament or you just gathered with the Rochester Frisbee Club and we just did or we did let's play golf for me golf was taking all those other skills reading the wind making being able to do a big arcing curve taking accuracy in, in doing a straight line drive to a target taking the distance for the drives incorporating it all into one event but go have fun who it's not it was like just taking everything i had already practiced and go have fun with it and <laughs> golf and my dad was a lifelong golfer so I knew um you know just the mentality of the sport in a sense and just and just I just enjoyed that one and just you so, know, kind of enjoyed you playing loop with friends and being outside and walking and enjoying beautiful nature you know God created and so I just kind of just enjoyed that event so yesterday I learned that you had there was five of five girls and two boys in your family growing up. So did your dad play golf with all y'all or did, was there just some that he would play with and some that didn't want anything to do with it or. Um, no, it, the reason being my grandmother worked weekends. So he, she had Thursdays off. So he took Thursdays off and worked Saturdays at his job in Rochester, brought her to our house. So we had a day with grandma. He'd go to the local golf at Genesee Valley Park. Did you ever play um, disc golf there when there was a couple of years? They they had a frisbee golf thing. But anyway, there was a public league, and he just played in the public leagues as often as he could. And so he played 
in May of 2019. He'll just do, you know, nine holes, maybe seven out of the nine. He has his handicapped leg so he can drive right up to where his ball is. And he passed away in August at age 96. He was so blind. Wow. Oh, wow. Awesome. Wow. 96 is great. But I have one sister that has started to pursue that sport. And, um, but I just appreciated everything. And I have a brother, yeah, to play and two, two others that do recreational. And um, they keep asking me, hey, let's go play. So someday I will get all as many siblings as I can and we'll go play. Nice. Nice. Yeah, that's good stuff. For now, sure. On this list, sorry, I know you want to ask a question, but the, the, it was a two pager there. DDC. That was the other thing that was. Oh, yeah, there. I see that. And that's that's important because that's invented by Jim Palmer. Yes, 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 yes. And again, pros were the, the disc of choice. I think they still use them, don't they? For I DD. Mean, yeah, yeah. you, you got to have something with a little flex in it so it doesn't totally. Yeah. So I, had, your arm. Um, you know, again, you'd get to a tournament and if you didn't have a partner, you'd just start asking around right there at registration or you'd maybe saw somebody the night before and say, hey, do you have a DDC partner yet? But I played with Cynthia Allen. I played with T.D. Ugaldi. Um, I wonder if I did play with Gail McCall. I just, I can't recall specifically. And then as Ultimate started coming in, I competed in Ultimate with some ladies from Cornell, from RIT, and now um, Suzanne Fields and um, Tina Booth are starting to come to a lot of the tournaments. And um, uh, John Cohn's wife, um, forgive me. I'm drawing a blank on her first name. But anyway, so you were starting to meet more women as more women are starting to compete. And um, so would just find a you know different partner and, and do DDC. So I, I, I enjoyed it, but um, probably that wasn't my favorite, but I didn't dislike it. I would just do anything available at most of the overalls. Did Jim uh, beta test that with the Rochester Frisbee Club before kind of launching it? He, he did. He would bring the strings and pegs and mark off the course. And then we'd play at the St. John Fisher College and on the athletic fields. And I'm sure it was yeah, kind of fine tuned. And um, we played it, you know, as fun recreational game. And uh, yeah, so he he got, got us all involved in everything. Yeah, I got you guys hooked. If, if there was anything else, it might be illegal how much influence he had on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well it, it was interesting talking with paul yesterday about all this too it, um i didn't i never really even gave this any thought but um i didn't realize that 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 these different overall um uh, events were from different regions of the country you know and and so that was that's a pretty fascinating thought too that that over time as people came together for these frisbee events they're like well wait we got a game that we could play too let's yeah. add this to the whole mix and yeah. You know, just like the whole organicness of of the of the roots of the whole thing, it's really cool and 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 appealing to think about. You know, how all that became because you know, like I started in the early '90s and and all of that. But I never even thought about where any of that came from. You know, I just knew that I was mostly interested in golf, and and so like like I was telling Paul yesterday that John Halk used to run Texas State Championships forever, mm -hmm. and we would get we would go and you sign up for the whole thing but most of us by the time i started playing them most of us didn't do anything but play the golf mm -hmm. and you always got three discs but they were 150 class but you oh. still got three discs so you know you're like well let's just do that and not right. worry about the rest of it yeah and it was i think attending all those overall tournaments that people would start kind of Oh, Dave wanted freestyle. He was just going to focus on freestyle. The other ones, you know, he would do them if he had the time, but he wanted to um, focus on Specialized. freestyle. Yeah. Exactly. And then, um, so here comes the uh, Freestyle Players Association. Um, Ultimate was getting big. So here comes the UPA, Ultimate Players Association. And now people are, you know, kind of going singularly into an event. There was um, Mike Conger, Snapper. He started, no, not Snappers, uh, Captain Snap, is it yeah, Mike? Captain, yeah, Captain Snap. But he started yes. um, Riders of the Wind, so he started a players' association for MTA people, TRC people, who enjoyed that event. So um, again, people, you know, started just really enjoying certain things and would find those tournaments to, you know, go off to. And and I, I know just from doing the reading that some of those decisions, like uh, I think Dave's decision to launch the FPA. 
a lot of that came from that that the prohibition against only using whammo products you know mm-hmm. you want to have something that's going to protect the interests of the players and right. the players want to play with the things they want to play with exactly yeah so hence you know they everyone loved the sky styler from discraft and um so as no David, shaving required yeah as he started yeah the fpa then he wanted to start a series of tournaments that featured just freestyle hence then you know um with this was a big, you know, freestyle uh, tournament yeah. with the World Flying Disc um, Federation. Is that, yeah, who hosted With that. Diff, right on. Okay, so Some other this, kind of, this is kind of jumping ahead because we still have a lot of stuff to talk about before 1984, but this kind of fits into this, this question that I have that I kind of came up with when we were talking to Cheryl last weekend. Um, the invention of the beveled, di- beveled edge disc to me it kind of occurred to me while we were talking to cheryl that it quite possibly ushered in the entry the end of the overalls is there any do you think there's anything to that i mean because it it made it easier to focus on one thing for sure and you know and i just told a story about how I was like, man, I just really want to go to the golf part of that event and I don't really care about the rest of it. And, and, you know, obviously that's just one story, but it just kind of made me wonder, did that draw more attention towards golf and folks just kind of, kind of forgot about the other stuff? I, I wonder, yeah, because um, once Whammo's championships after that 82, then wasn't, when was the first, um pdga championship i mean they did that fifty thousand dollar pdga um event in 79 yeah. so was there an a 82 was the first worlds okay so then 82 were the first world yeah. so now as again it, it it is drawing people and you know with the the new disc but didn't they come out these weren't till 83 right yeah but here's my you know there's your arrow, there your you eagles go. and your arrows. Look at that. In fact, on the back of all these, it just it doesn't give me a model or whatever. It just says patent pending. Yeah. Uh-huh. But I still use these, you know. Oh boy. Nice. You gotta watch um, out for it. So then, yes, then the, but then they started using these for distance, you know, if there was a distance event because they did go farther. And um, you know, it just it, you know, you just now had exclusive discs for different events. And I think the draw of so many ultimate players enjoying it as that started, you know, through the colleges, then who's a premier great golfer, a person who can chuck the disc and run and catch and throw and weave. And golf, I think, came natural to a lot of ultimate players. And so mm-hmm. they heard this tournament, hey, let's go check this out. And so I think a lot came over from, from ultimate days. Right. Well, you can definitely tell an ultimate player that became a golfer, though, because of the the lean out and the sidearm, you know, I mean, like it's a dead yeah. giveaway. Oh, wait, you played ultimate, didn't you? And they're like, how yeah, do you know? And it's like yeah. that throw right there that you just did. They're like, <laughs> oh, really? OK, you know, and um, yeah, the only woman on the Rochester Frisbee Club ultimate team. And I remember traveling to Amherst, Massachusetts, playing college teams, but they allow, you know, city clubs. And I was the only woman, but finally there was one woman on one of the other ones. It's like, oh, good. She's going out. Can I go out? So, you know, you'd be really left in the dust if you were, you know, it was person to person defense. And a lot of times if I was out there, I'd get left in the dust by a real fast guy. So I wasn't effective. So I didn't get a lot of play time until they would put out a woman. Then I could go and we'd, you know, be on the, on the defense, person to person defense. And so I finally got a little more playing. And then again, as more women got involved, finally, you know, women's division started. And then um, that was Dave's and my recreational sport in the early 80s when we stopped more of the tournament play and just played local with our um, local ultimate club and just enjoyed that for recreational and for, you know, keeping fit. I remember bringing one of my kids, yeah, maybe two of my kids, you know, to the ultimate fields and we'd tag team, you know, who watches the kids or, hey, wait, they're eating a snack, but I'm going out, you know, <laughs> and somebody would watch your kids for you. So it was right a good, good True family. Yeah. So There's more than one reason it takes a village. <laughs> let's, let's, yeah. let's introduce the, this. We've talked to a lot of, 
a lot of our guests so through the course of the of doing the show have mm-hmm. logged a lot of miles. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, Steve Valencia and and Dan Jinley, Jinley, sorry, they they put on thousands in over two a course of two or three years. But you guys were among the original barnstormers, and mm-hmm. you had it arranged. Uh, Dave was studying law, so he had summers off, and you were working for St. John's College as well. So you had arranged they had some results. We were in Albany. Yeah, my little college was called the College of St. Rose. Oh, and sorry. I took summers off. They didn't need me. They didn't have a big summer semester. I worked in the business office. So we had those summers free that we could do that travel. And with an old junker of a car or a Ford tree and a wagon, we would just pack it with, you know, mats for sleeping if we wanted, all our camping gear, you know, the discs. Oh, that's what I didn't get you. Um, one of the girls mentioned the ice cream tub. I still have an ice cream tub. Okay, oh, yes. nice. That was, is it I can disappear off camera. I will go get it. I don't I'm know. Even Tammy. But um, anyway, you stack all your discs in that, load that in the back with all your other gear, and off you go. And we <laughs> I didn't realize the Torino belonged to y'all. So <laughs> that's our- going to come up again, too, folks. Just yeah. a few, just a, you know, a little warning. The Torino will be spoken of again, but. Ford Torino wagon, yeah, yeah. So your normal diet is is essentially peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It's about yeah. What and you're going to from tournament to tournament. Was there prize money available so that you, if you did win, you could a little a bit. Dinner? Occasionally, maybe twenty five, fifty dollars if I was third, second in golf. A little bit later in the seventies, there was one tournament. I think I won $300, but I never saw the prize money because the p- tournament director kind of cut loose and nobody heard from her again. But anyway, it's okay. She made the Interesting. Right. And yeah. so that $300 is on my, what would you call, pro. Back then, you signed up and if you got money, it's like, yay. So I, I was pro back then. I didn't know that there was an option right. to decline. Um, money it's like no i'll take that money it's going to put gas in the tank right. you know hey we can go out to dinner tonight instead of just eating you know stuff and from the grocery store or you know out of the cooler so um yeah and had different prize money and then th- that would get you going you know into the next um onto the next tournament but again i mentioned yesterday um to brian that one summer well, my grandmother died in January, but she left each grandchild a thousand dollars. That was like wow. We lived off that money in the summer. Another summer, Dave's dad, granddad passed and kind of did the same thing. So we had you know a little extra cash to live off of. Sublet our apartment in Albany, got on the road, lived then at our parents' place during that summer as we would you know head off to this tournament, come back. Home base was still Rochester. Go back to another tournament, be gone three weeks, come back. Wow. And then go back in, you know, late August and get our apartment back and resume life. But see, people think maybe they may think about how star studded and, and thickly studded the tournament schedule is now. We're talking like one weekend and you're in Seattle, the next weekend you're in Huntsville, mm-hmm. back and forth across the country. Well, we would try to do it because I remember going down the northern trek, we went to Minneapolis, and then we probably carried off through the Dakotas, but ended up in Seattle, Vancouver, then came back somehow, I don't know if we, there was something in the Midwest, and then come back home, where Boulder was, was always a stop, and so we always loved Boulder as a, as a tournament location. So. Well, since, since we're talking Boulder, and this is, we're talking road stories, and we're talking the other oh, yeah. Perfect segue. Uh, it's a perfect segue. So you go to the Western Nationals. This is 1977. Yeah. Uh, Dave takes second in MTA. Okay, you yeah. tie for second in golf with Monica Lou and Jackie Antlis. So before we get to your story there, this is the story where Cheryl told us she okay. dominated. She wins by six strokes. The year before, she went to Boulder thinking she had a chance. She was playing a hot. She was good. She got yeah. humbled. She humbled herself. She was down in the mouth and Monica comes over and says, you know, there's always another one around the corner. And Cheryl looks up and says, yes, I'm going to come back here next year and win. And you show up and what happens? Cheryl wins. Oh, okay. Good for Cheryl. But yeah, it's just that you went, you had fun. You did the best you could do at that tournament, that event, and you carried on. And like I said, there was a next one. And um, 
one of the, again, because you're at these NAS, North American series, trying to qualify, we just enjoyed the travel. So there was a point where I probably had enough points and didn't need to go, but we're already on the road and we're enjoying it. And, you know, you just love the group of people that, you know, you were with and traveled with and interacted with. And you just, you know, God gave us a great, you know, just a great season of life to just meet people and be, you know, the forerunners of the sport. So we, yeah, we give glory to God for that. We just appreciate, you know, those opportunities we were given. And so um, you're, you're in Boulder and you got to drive back to watch this. Yep. Yeah. And all right. So we go out with two vehicles, two the vehicle, four yeah. train away, just maybe four of us in that Jim Palmieri drives out with his VW bus with um, Jamie Mould, probably Billy O'Dell, Doug Correa. And um, so I don't know who is in our car, but anyway, you do this tournament. That one was a weekend event. Literally we left on Thursday night after everybody got out of work, drove all night. Wow. Late Friday. What? Practice golf, because at least that's one event, you know, you know, kind of need to practice. Dave was probably off practicing freestyle, but Jim had to get home for something. So he flew out of Denver that I don't know who took him to the airport, but he said, you guys drive my van home. He said, okay. Bruce Kroger and Marie Murphy asked for a ride because, you know, you start talking, how are you getting home? Oh, yeah. Are you staying long? No, we're going to go on to this. Offered them a ride because there's now more room in these two gar cars, but we're still going to um, kind of carpool it, stay together. And so we start out with Jim Palmieri's van, start Sunday night, right? Taking off after the tournament and do kind of an all-nighter. So you did a four-hour driving shift. Then it was somebody else's turn. You'd stop, get gas. Next driver, come on in. I don't know who was driving the van. If it was Doug Correa, but all of a sudden he can't get the clutch out. And he can't shift beyond second gear. So we're in the middle of the night. I just remember it's between 2 and 3 a.m. I'm ready to take the next, the graveyard shift in our Torino they can't, and, and so we stop, but they're realizing, okay, something's wrong. We can't start it. We can't get it out of second gear after this gas stop, who knows where, in Cozad, Nebraska. <laughs> and now they can't get his van going, but I had already known I'm ready to drive. So I'm drinking tab and took a nose. Totally a artificial beverage. Oh, no dose so that I can get ready to drive. Tab but and a no dose. Oh, man nowhere because we don't want to leave that group who were with the van because we're going to go together so guess what we're all camping out under the stars at the gas station waiting for the mechanic to come the next morning to take a look at it and so finally I fell asleep but the guy comes the next morning looks at Jim Palmieri's VW van and when he goes to the front of the van to look under the hood for the engine they knew wait a minute, no, 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 no. This mechanic doesn't even know where the engine is. Um, don't go any further. So it's Monday morning or Tuesday morning. We tie up that van to our Ford Torino wagon. I don't know what we use to hitch it, but off we go to the next, a VW dealer who's in Lincoln, Nebraska. So whoever's driving Jim Palmberry's van sits there with the clutch in the entire time so they can just be towed by our wagon. And we've got a dog with us besides. So now we get nine, to- And nine adults, that's just so crazy. Yeah, we leave the van there so the mechanic there can now give the horrible, of course, we're in touch with Jim Palmieri best we can without cells. You find the nearest pay booth or whatever, pay phone in a booth, let him know. And he says, okay, just tell the mechanic, here's my number, be in touch with me when we know what's wrong. Everybody goes into our Ford Torino three seater, you know, that back bench and our dog, but we rented a U-Haul trailer to put all our, you know, duffel bags and our equipment and everything. Pile into that, drive to Chicago, drop off Marie Murphy and Bruce Kroger, then the rest of us carry on, seven of us now on to Rochester and finally got home. And doesn't David turn around the next weekend he goes to Boston because there's a tournament, freestyle tournament there with a bunch of guys. And I said, uh -uh, I don't want anything to do with the road. <laughs> I want to stay. <laughs> it was a freestyle tournament. And off he went to Boston with probably Doug Korea and, and you know, somebody else. So Doug yeah. was his, his traditional uh, freestyle partner, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the mm, 76, 77, 78, I think, were their premier years. Yeah. So 
So yeah. this is this is 1977 we're talking about, and um, you said you'd already you'd gone down the octet in '77. Uh, by the way, you, you took first in MTA there. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um, the very next day, you play Craigmere, where, where you get your PGA number. And the only thing I want to bring up here is the comment that apparently it was a beautiful uh, ski hill course yeah. that crisscrossed. Right. Uh, and it played all the way down, and then you take a chairlift back up to the clubhouse at the top, which must have been mm -hmm. super cool. Now, here's where the interesting part for, for us uh, from this retrospective position. The meet featured the introduction of a somewhat more stringent playing rules, including placement of the lead foot behind a disc placed uh, where the lie is, and outlawing any extra practice throws during play. So the PDG, PDJ comes in with their fancy new organization and they impose two major rules changes. Uh, did they affect you at all? Were you, were you putting your lead foot outside the disc or in front of I you? think what we probably did is wherever the disc came to lie, you put your foot right on it versus making this perpendicular line behind it and staying behind it. Okay. So it wasn't as inches that you're just, and you just got to be aware of the perpendicular line behind your disc, not your foot where your disc was picked up. So there was, a, yeah. So they just probably wanted to establish something with. Sure. No, it's understandable. But did that mess you up as a player? Oh, okay. So I don't remember it ever, okay. being, you know, something that, oh, well, I can't believe that. You know, yeah. And then, um, <clears throat> Yeah, so I just, you know, we just did the tournament and I just remember again, yeah, kind of being at this um, ski hilly thing and a lot of zigzagging, but again, scenic, beautiful outdoor event, you know, great weather as far as I can, I can remember. I don't remember, you know, being rained on or anything. I think we had a good weekend. So, Sweet. and then we drive home at night, right? You're done at about five, awards are between <laughs> six and seven and you hit the road you know and you, you make it home so how far was that, that i think that from that area crazy. new jersey probably six and a half seven hours yeah not horrible you're getting in wee hours in the morning but you could do it we were right. young yeah, right. well yeah i mean with no does and um tab. And, uh, tab i mean what do you what else do you need yeah, yeah. So what's what's on? Is it the radio station only? Do you have an eight track in the in the car? I know this is. Oh, the yeah, eight track. No, we got into cassettes. We're we're really? big. Yeah, cassettes. Okay. Um, that's what Dave played, and then the kind of boom boxes. I mean, you could get them battery operated, so you had your freestyle music going on the side of the green wherever you're, you know, playing, and you had the yeah you know, cassette. You could buy the cassette players for those older cars and kind of insert them somewhere. I guess if you okay. took the radio out, you could insert a cassette player. And so um, then, yeah, so I think that's how we you know, was the music of the day. Do, did someone have control of the music or, or yeah. any yeah. grudges? No? Okay. Yeah. We used to make our own cassette tapes off the radio. We had one radio station in Albany that would play a whole series of just one artist. And we have a whole Beatles tape. We had a whole, um, Dave loved um, Jean-Luc Ponty. If you, you know, he was a jazz musician and had you know, a lot of his music. And so we'd bring our own little cassettes and, and off we go. <laughs> that's one thing that's been, you know, I mean, that's a very universal language with the music, you know, it's always, um, I don't know, I've always felt I read this play this one time where someone said, if you feel like you need music at the beach, you've missed it. And I counter that with um, music's kind of like putting cake with ice cream. I mean, I'm going to eat the cake Enjoy. with or without the ice cream, but ice cream makes that cake just a little bit better, doesn't it? You know, and I feel like music is like ice cream, you know, it just makes things well, even better. Dave will tell you that, yeah, again, he could probably tell you every music and the the song they picked for that event and stuff like that. I don't have as great a recall, but he's a musician. I mean, he grew up, you know, in the high school bands and stuff and plays guitar now on our worship team at church and has always enjoyed music. So, and the artistry, you know, of different music genres. So he, he would know every artist that he used for a freestyle competition. Well, we'll be sure when we do have him on the show that we'll, uh, We'll talk to them specifically about the playlists. Yes. Life before Spotify. Yeah. <laughs> Again, like you said, we made our own tapes recording off the radio. Oh, I, I remember doing that, hitting pause for the... Yeah, and the hoping commercial. they didn't start a commercial before the song was over. Yeah, yeah I, I remember that as well. Yeah, so...
so uh you know we don't want to bog down too much in the stats and the details um you know we, you, you started playing a lot more frequently through seven you had a lot of time those were your big tour years but uh, yeah i want to i want to bring you to 78 the world uh, flying champion this is before the wfc before you became the reigning golf champion mm -hmm. this is the year leading up to this and you you did you did excellent there you took second in golf second in ddc second in distance you won the indoor distance mm -hmm. um i mean this was a oh, one thing that occurred to me who was your partner for that ddc do you remember i i don't remember it i have to go back yeah. and look so i'm not sure as either i so, it might have been cynthia allen and i paired up a lot and again she was another premier golfer coming out of um the south and um um Florence, Alabama, then Huntsville, Tom Monroe, and, and that whole crew. And Cynthia, um, I'm still in touch with her today. We do Christmas cards exchange. Mm -hmm. So I have the discs that Tita got a bunch of us to sign at the um, the Pioneers while I'm getting a couple more um, signatures. And I'm going to send it to her to sign my disc. Wow. And then I'll Joanne Loftus. And I, Judy Horowitz, I've got to get in touch with as well. Nice. In touch Great with names. But Cynthia, bless her heart, uh, you know, she came to Rochester in 1979 and Jim Palmieri again knew the importance of establishing a premier event. So he established um, a cup. So it was, you know, a big cup with the handles and a nice big um, square base that you could start with putting on the plaque, the name of the player who won that event year to year. So he said, we will name this tournament after the first winner, and it was in 1979 in Rochester at his premier golf events, and um, Cynthia Allen won it. So it is called oh. the Allen Cup. So nice. her, her first name, 1979, is the winner, and now it's named after her. And then this past year, because of the AFDO's 50th anniversary, people were asking, does anybody know where this Allen Cup is and where it is? And I, I can't remember. We got in touch with Judy Horowitz, who won it. I won it, I think, two or three years being, um, again, always staying in Rochester, going to the championship or champion, then they bring it back. Um, they'll engrave it and then have it ready for the next event and cannot find it. Do not know where it is, but Cynthia, um, it's the Allen Cup, Cynthia Allen, because she was a premier golfer, distance thrower, DDC or field events as well. But she chose after um, kind of when that Frisbee life season was done, she ended up in California and then married um, a, a man that she met. I think he was a dentist. I could be wrong and um, lives in central California. Um, I think kind of near Sacramento area mm -hmm. and he has two boys. And so it was fun exchanging cards and seeing her boys and my boys, you know, kind of grow through the years. And so, you know, your seasons of life change and David's and mine surely did. And again, him having a career path already established all during these three years, he knew he was going to be an attorney, but then being an attorney turned into, you know, going in-house general counselor and then into um, management, business management. And that's what took us to England in um, 84, 84 to 87. So we had that season of life and, and just came back um, just different people. I mean, I, I just had a wonderful encounter with the Lord and just really... Um, grew my faith walk and that's how I would say it but we both established a, a great faith walk um from 80 yeah 80 85 to 88 <clears throat> but um the interesting story there is when we moved to England we heard Jeff Hungerford was living there doing a master's program with and we met to his wife and so we would go visit them in central London we were about 30 miles outside in a town called High Wycombe but we'd go and spend the day with them, go to church in the morning, then go have a wonderful lunch and then go visit a museum. And so it was Jeff Hungerford that suggested in 1985, if I'm not jumping ahead of you guys. No, we can jump. No, that's there. quite all right. It was this world championship up in Sweden. And I thought, okay, well, okay. Yeah, cool. We can make a vacation of it. And we had a little one-year-old and um, he traveled with his wife. We went up, got our accommodations and then went to this tournament called the... Yes. Yeah. So in Helsingborg, Sweden, 1985, just golf championships. And wow. so I arrived there and I didn't know what other Americans would travel over, met, you know, some folks from European, but Tammy Pelican was there and Tammy, Tammy won it uh, handily. I think she beat us by at least six or eight strokes. 
five strokes. Five six. And so I came in second and um, who was third? Um, oh, I have that right here. I have a poster, and I think I told Brian, I have a poster and I have Sammy Farron's signature. I have Tom Chris Monroe. O'Cleary. I have Chris, 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 Chris O'Cleary. Chris O'Cleary, Chris. Yep. yep, Chris O'Cleary, yep. So she signed my poster, Tammy signed my poster. Um, Snapper Pearson, um, who else? Um, Scott Stokely as a junior. Nice. Sammy, yeah, Sammy Ferens. So yeah. I was, I got a great, yeah, memorabilia. So, so this is, I'm looking at the stats right now, and um, <clears throat> I see in seventh place out of 17 pro uh, FPO, Joanne Gallagher. Now, I, she used to live in Toronto. Um, she just moved to Collingwood. And she, I bumped into her quite randomly on the street this, this week. Oh, yeah. And I did. And so I told her, I'd already been, I'd reached out to her to see if she'd be a guest. And so okay. this was our chance to confirm that, yes, she's going to be on the show. And I told her who I have coming up today. And she said, oh, my God, Michelle Marini. She was my mentor. She taught me everything about disc golf. Uh, so maybe this is a good segue. Do you have any Joanne Gallagher reminiscences? I, I don't because again, in that season of life, because you're going to this tournament, but yet I, I always had Dave, how's, how's Matt, our little toddler and stuff like that. And, and we, you know, we kind of had a little vacation. We went to, um, Stockholm for a little bit. So I guess I wasn't fully engaged for me. It was this, oh, cool vacation. Oh, a Frisbee golf tournament. I'll, I'll do it, you know? And, and so, but, um, yeah, Joanne, I got, I've got to Wreck the brain a little bit more. Okay. But she was out of Toronto? Yeah. Okay. So and then she was she was a really big she's she's in the uh TUC Hall of Fame for ultimate uh, foundation of the sport. So okay. she, you know, you guys might have even passed to the same circles when you were in Oh yeah, years. yeah. Because you know, how many times we attended that tournament? Right on. Right. Yeah. Toronto Island. So yeah, we yeah, because I, I know the name and it just yeah, it just I have so many people, you know, recollection on individuals sometimes gets a little, yeah. You know. Well, we didn't prep you on this, so you're coming at this fresh and, you know, you're, you're digging up a lot of great stories already. And, uh, you know, thank you for, for indulging our, our passion, especially mine for the minute. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Um, when we talked to Tita, uh, getting also kind of continuing with the Toronto story, she came to Rochester and then she told me that you guys all, road trip up to Toronto for the Toronto tournament. Okay. Uh, I believe that she said it was the, the two of you, herself and the Velasquez brothers. Do you remember, do you recall that trip? I don't, again, real specific, but I remember having a picture with Tita going down to my mom and dad's summer place. And we hiked, uh, it's called um, Letchworth State Park. And um, I have a picture of her and I hiking. So there must have been either she came a couple of days early and we went there and then we did the tournament. Then next weekend, go up to Toronto. Um, but I, I, you know, not specific recollections because again, if she, she probably, she remembers who she stayed with and who she went out to eat. I'm always traveling with David. So he and I are, our logistics might be different than everybody else's that traveled in a bigger group. Sure. And we just knew, okay, we got to get up on Friday. We got to get back Sunday night, you know, so our hanging out before or after. But I remember Tita being with me between tournaments and and staying and going to visit my mom's place and her staying with us. So, um, and then I, I love her little comment that when I went out to California, she was the first one to introduce me to Mexican food. And then did Cheryl mention, I haven't listened to Cheryl's podcast, but she's the first one I ever had salmon with up in yes. the West. Oh, yeah. And so, yes, I'm expanding my culinary <laughs> awareness, you know, by traveling. So it's, a, again, a great opportunity. I mentioned to Brian yesterday, just, again, the road miles that have been covered uh, doing Frisbee that we got majority of the states covered in doing all this driving, you know, east, west, north, south. So we have both, uh, Dave and I have been to all 50 states now because then we knew which ones we didn't make and made purposeful vacations. And our 35th wedding anniversary was to Alaska to do wow. a visit there. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I haven't got there yet. And I haven't got to Hawaii. Yeah, that but, was our you know, it's, there's just so many different things, different, different things took me different places like that as well. Like you were talking about traveling through on the way too. And 
some of mine's like that as well, but it's either work or, or disc golf or both, you know, in most of those places for me, mm -hmm. or, you know, some personal vacations as well. Right. But no, ours, the majority were yeah, the, the hours on the road traveling from tournament to tournament got a big chunk of the, the number of states um, yeah, out of the way. As you mentioned, we had a little atlas, you know, and mine was a mini one. And every time we went through a state, I had a little green check mark in the corner. <laughs> a little miniature atlas. But yeah, you lived on roadmaps. Yeah. And just, you know, had them ready. It wasn't yeah. all, I wasn't always in the phone. That's for sure. Exactly. Oh, you I'm had to. No, how many how many times did you guys get lost and who was who was the main map Jim Palmer, no, Jim Palmer is a great navigator and always had the maps and always kept us you know and even though he'd let us drive and you'd take your shifts he'd be there with the map and he you know there'd always be a co-pilot so you were kind of always somebody would be looking at the map making sure if it wasn't just a straight shot on a interstate <clears throat> so you always kind of had that co-pilot helping out with the map uh, yeah it's pretty amazing it's pretty amazing how we used to find these little spots and mm -hmm. now like, now like you can't get out of town without a, you know, without, without GPS on your phone, you know? Yeah. Oh no. My, again, my dad always had maps, you know? And so I've always enjoyed and still, you know, have maps. And when we moved in downside, I had to throw away a lot of my maps and that, you know, and they were just the ones you could buy at, at gas stations, but they're, you know, they got us everywhere, you know? So. Yeah, it's really, it's something else. Mm -hmm. So in 1979, you, it was a pretty big year for you. And uh, for the North American Series in Huntsville, you took second in distance and you won golf. Mm -hmm. Tied for second in DDC with Cynthia Allen. And then you won self-caught, excuse me, self-caught, yeah. self-caught flight. Mm -hmm. Didn't seem like such a trend twister when I started. So what do you remember about that trip to Huntsville? I mean, obviously that must have been pretty triumphant winning the golf there and everything. Um, I enjoyed, again, Tom Monroe would design the course. I remember earlier years it was objects, but I'm sure by then it was um, pole holes. But I remember finally discovering sunscreen. Sunscreen uh... wasn't in the early 70s and so finally I remember taking a just a cloth and having to cover my head because the intense sun I wasn't real good on keeping a visor as well or a baseball cap but I just remember the intense sun and that he had samples of sunscreen and so finally ugh, started incorporating more head cover more sunscreen because of those southern tournaments that we would get to and um so that's how we know what there you are right there with okay. the, oh, okay. the yeah yeah yeah. See, yeah so i had at least a scarf you know to avoid the sunburn but then you'd get that little red mark because you'd be all red under your scarf <laughs> your head scarf and finally the visors yeah got into visors but yeah a lot of sun damage back in those days so please well, how yourself. was it how was it coming you're growing up in rochester like you know living in, under semi-humid muggy conditions only for a couple of weeks in the summer right. it go down to huntsville in june and that's sweltering yep, yep. Oh, 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 oh man yeah, well, you, you you had to learn it uh, yeah there's just certain times yeah you run to the shade any opportunity you get and then you quick go back out throw get to the shade but yeah rochester only had like say one or two weeks when it was just intensely uncomfortable but um, yeah, finally, then living in the South, we lived in Atlanta and boy, you just learn, you know, certain times of days, but lots of sunscreen, lots of cover. But um, the one thing I do remember with one of our Huntsville trips is Dave got horrible food poisoning. Mm -hmm. And um, so, the, you know, again, you're going out to eat on the Saturday night, Sunday night, but oh, he was yeah throwing up all night. So, man, yeah. that's one of the worst experiences <laughs> ever. Mean, yeah, Chinese and just wasn't probably a well turned over restaurant. So that he'll tell you <laughs> that's one of his horror stories, getting food poisoning. But but yeah, got to yeah, I remember one time too, Cynthia Allen um hosted us to stay at, at her house too. And so again, just a, a great host, a great friend. And you know, she came up our way, um, you know, we host. And so you just always opened your home, you know, to accommodate friends and whoever was passing through. So Absolutely. Well, I can't speak for the, the current situation, but that was, I mean, 
that was part of what solidified Paul and I's, you know, friendship. I mean, he was looking for a place to stay when he was mm -hmm. here, you know, volunteering for one of the Veterans Park Open events right. in the 90s. And I mean, I traveled from 99 to 08. And I guarantee I didn't buy a hotel room 5% of the time because, you know, wow. there was always somebody that was willing to put you up. And then once you made friends with somebody next year, they were already looking forward. They were probably communicating already with you. Okay. So when are you get into town, you know, yeah. you know, you got a place to stay with us. It's plan on coming over. And, you know, there's so many nights where I was at Friday night, sun's going down and, uh, you know, like I'd played doubles with somebody or, you know, just played a practice round and they're like, Oh, Hey, where are you staying? And I'm like, Oh, you know, I hadn't even thought about that yet. And they're like, what do you mean you hadn't thought about it? Well, come stay at our house, you know? And, and there were so many times that I really, I didn't give it a lot of thought most of the time because it, it just got to be the common occurrence. What, Oh, you don't have it figured out. Well, why don't you stay with us? And, and I made so many more good friends from that, you know, than just like from the people you played with the round during the round or whatever, you know? So. Because we traveled so much that if we did and could afford a hotel and we weren't going to camp, you would get as many people into that room. So we would take. Oh a, yeah. We've ganged up on a few hotels too. People would sleep on the mattress and the box springs, but just you know, <laughs> sleep in the back of the car. So you get as many people in that room as possible. And then yeah. people get two chairs together and, and, have a semi happy there, you know. So <laughs> there we can get by on tiny any, budget, you know. Any which way but loose for sure. So uh so 79 is is uh you're really tuning it in. You're you're winning a lot. You win distance in Vancouver, Rochester, you win the golf there, um took second in on in Toronto, took six at the Whammo fifty thousand dollar open. Yeah, now that that's kind of a, a tasty appetizer for your big debut at the World Frisbee Championship, 1979. You win the golf and you win distance. Mm -hmm. um, second overall. This is also where Ashley Whippet has a special performance. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, by the way, canine sports, hard for us to believe now, but how important they were, how central they were back mm -hmm. then. Oh, it brought the crowds. The dogs always brought the crowds. And, um, you know, we know people that had Frisbee dogs. John Pickerel had Martha. We had a dog named Lee, and, and she was in a 4th of July parade with us. Jim Palmieri orchestrated this. It was the town he taught in, this Penfield. And, and the dog, you know, she would do the little catch and bring it back to us. And then we'd walk a little bit and then she they'd do a little freestyle. Then we'd do a little doggy demo. And, and it got so hot there. I remember her saying, no, I'm done. She, I just walked with her along the side. But the dogs, yeah, that was a great event. And those competitions are still going today with all the, who's the big dog, Kate? I can't think of the name of the, you know, you still see them, you know, the, the dog competitions. Okay. It's not just the Westchester Dog Show. Yeah. So uh, while we talk about the uh, Rose Bowl, I just want to share this. This was some fun footage that I found of these are the Velasquez brothers and they're, they won the freestyle that year. I mm -hmm. just like, this is what, you can't really tell because this is taken from the stands how many people, but there are probably about 20,000 people there watching the finals. Right. This was filmed, I think, for the first time by the local ABC affiliate. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Dave and, and Doug would have been there. Or, it, no, Dave said in 79, he played with John Jewell, I think, at the Rose Bowl. Okay. But anyway, um, yeah, when would... Or, or, they did one thing is they put a lot of the people that came in on one side and then did all their filming with those brothers, but with all the, um, you know, seeing everyone on in the bleachers, a fuller crowd. Right. right. This, yeah. This is, you can see all the judges there. I saw uh, Danny McGinnis. So there was always um, a judging panel and Dave and Jim Palm, Jim Palmieri was um, key in trying to get um, judging done by artistic ability um, what do you call it? I have to ask him three components of the judging. So it was more like ice dancing where it is, um, difficulty, artistic choreography, ability, 
choreography. Yeah, yeah. So now you're being judged on all three components. And the difficulty, that was the other one. Yep, so then the, there's a judging panel of probably about 10 people off to the side, and then you would write your score of those three components. Then they would average the scoring of all the judges and then take the overall. And then that's how you would have the judging done of um, the freestylists. These guys are amazing. Yeah, they're really cooking. Oh, yeah. yeah we both. Now, we, when we see in the foreground there, there's a, there's a pool hole right there, number 12. Yeah. Was that just used? for demonstration purposes because by this time on the sunday the the golf has been wrapped up they might have yes they might have taken the two i don't remember ever doing it but maybe the two men finishers first and second have them come in from the um entryway have them throw across the field and and, and demo a golf hole okay. with that is the the final you know where they're going to throw two but they've got to go around this pole and they've got to make the dog leg and then um you know get it to the target so um yeah they would have done a little demo of the whoever won golf that year and had them you know be introduced as the champion but probably play against one other guy the second place winner was this from 79 that one yeah. what we were watching right there that's from 79 79 yeah. Rose Bowl. yeah that's just so amazing that was, so, that was right on youtube yeah it's a it says never before seen camera action um and there's there's one point where you can see uh the crowd like it's, there's some kind of disturbance in the crowd the police had to come down and so you can see like clearly there's like just at least what they they cram people into is packed yeah 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 so it, it looks like yeah there's big full attendance when the camera angle is correct but the, yeah they, they they knew to, they did well but yet tita said that was you know her first experience as being in those crowds and it introduced her to the sport yeah. well and hearing her talk about hearing it on the radio you know what i mean and like that's one thing like i you know i you mentioned spotify earlier and and as soon as jonathan Poole told me oh just get premium like the first time i ever heard of it i signed up for spotify premium and the mm -hmm. thing i still to this day kind of don't completely haven't gotten over is not owning music and not having like a, a music collection, but mm -hmm. you have the whole catalog on your phone. So it kind of gets past it, but mm -hmm. Spotify is totally taking the place from radio in my life. Like I don't listen to the radio when I'm driving in the car anymore. I listen mm -hmm. to playlists and stuff like that. And so hearing Tita talk like that took me back to my childhood and listening to the radio station. And like my dad, um, my dad had a, a love for kites from his childhood and so like local radio station, when we were a kid, they had this kite fly in and they had several different categories. Well, for like three years in a row, we, my dad just built a bigger box kite every year. And like oh. the, the third year he had to tie it onto the bumper of our pickup truck once he got it up in the air, cause it had to fly for a minute. And, and, but, it, but, you know, like you hear about those kind of things on the radio, we don't hear about that kind of stuff anymore. You know, we don't, there's not like that, the that local spot farmer. where they're going to find people like us and go, Hey, we got a Frisbee contest going on Saturday, you know, at blah, 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 blah. Come on down. And it's like, uh, well, how do we expose that now? You know, you always had a radio station and a, a, like a beer sponsorship or something where you know, the two that would kind of, you know, be, uh, again, Dave can talk to you that when he would get sponsors for the freestyle players association championships and stuff, but yeah, definitely had to find that local radio station first, first and foremost. For your advertising so yeah yeah that's good stuff those um well you know things are good but things were good back then too mm -hmm. simpler definitely simpler so <clears throat> we don't want to dwell too much on the year to year but uh, i do want to point out 1980 was mm -hmm. statistically from a golf perspective the most uh, impressive successful year you won every golf event that you played, including a repeat as a champion at the World Frisbee Championships. Um, you also went to the World Flying Disc Championships in Santa Cruz. And you won that. You uh, win in Rochester, uh, Philadelphia as well. Um, how does that feel? You're kind of on top of the world there. You're, you're, you know, you're now that kind of person that. Tita was in the position to look up to Monica Lou. There might be some younger women in the game looking up to you. Do you feel that? Do you do you, looking back on that? Do, what are your what are your impressions of 
of how you felt. I think, again, I think it was just um, taking the opportunity as it presented itself. And at that season that we were able to take those summers off, compete, go, I, I did, I never remember in my mind saying, oh, I'm going to do this and do this so I can do this better. It's just like, no, I just go with it. And okay. Oh, great. Another tournament. Oh, let's go play. Oh, okay. It is golf. I will practice distance, you know, for the teeing off and there might be, you know, an MTA. Oh, okay. I'll practice that. But it was just showing up and we were at the right place at the right time, you know, for that season of life. And in 80, um, that's when David graduated law school. So I knew our, commitment to be able to do that kind of travel was going to wind down so like we flew out to california we didn't drive um for that um you know santa cruz tournament but um again reflecting back now to know that i was the first repeat champion for women's golf you know that's an honor you know that i was able to do it back to back with whammos and then i think back to back was there one in 81 80 and 81 at this um world flying disc yeah that's right and so again, he just to have that on the records is is is, a, is an honor, you know. But I, I I just thank God that I was in the right place at the right time, and you know, had, had the right skills. In high school, we didn't have women's sports, so I played intramural, you know, and I played the local. Oh, okay. And then played women's fun volleyball at nighttime after graduating high school. And so to get into a sport like Frisbee was like, wow, this is fun. You know, I can really do something. And then to be able to succeed and, and you know, continue to progress. But yet, again, travel and make friends and have life experiences. Yeah. You just can't, you know, you can't beat well, it. I want to put it into perspective. In 75, you watch Monica Lou throw a distance clinic and you get to throw a shot yourself and yeah. you realize I'm not very good at this. Four short years later, you win golf. Mm -hmm. So that learning curve, those indoor uh, over you know over the winter indoor sessions, those under the lights frisbee night sessions, the work you put into it as well, perhaps your mindset to it, the much more you know free and less less circumscribed by well, I think too, knowing where we lived in Rochester, we had the frisbee you know, the Frisbee club, our Rochester Frisbee club. So there was always something going on that you could engage in or go, hey, we're going to go here and do this. We're going to do this here. Hey, there's an ultimate. Let's get ready for ultimate. You know, let's go practice here. And um, so just having that accessibility to a, a great group, you know, in Rochester that loved all the disciplines of this sport and yeah. having the availability, just everything fell in place. So again, I just thank the Lord for you know those great opportunities, great friends, great season of life, you know. But it's um well, and it's really it's so remarkable too how how many of us have such um such a deeply ch cherished series of of stories that relate to yeah. us throwing around plastic widget, you know what I mean? Like like Cheryl talked about Ralph Williamson, and mm -hmm. I. I last weekend and I just happened to show up in uh, at this course called Lakewood and mm -hmm. and I was I already knew some golfers from National Doubles that I'd met that had come down for that event that John Hawk used to run and so I called one of them up and um we just happened to run into Ralph Williamson there and then a few weeks later I just happened to see him interviewed on CNN as wow. like a, a like a lunchtime feature or something like that it was just Cause they would, you know, they would run shows like that. And I was like, Holy cow, I met that guy. You know, I met him, you know, a few weeks ago. And I mean, I was already playing tournaments. I wasn't a pro. I wasn't a touring player or anything like that. But one of the things I'll never forget him saying, cause they were like, well, you have, you have one of the biggest Frisbee collections in the world. And he kind of brushed that off a little bit. And, and his explanation was, well, he said, when you throw a Frisbee, you can fly. And that kind of is what you're talking about. That's kind of that whole thought mm -hmm. led you, led Paul, led myself to all these different fun experiences and, and the opportunity to make friends all over the continent, you know, and, and, and so that's you, honestly you, at the root of what we're trying to do more than anything is just to remind everybody, Hey, remember when you went and did this, you know, and, 
And it all started, yeah, somewhere. And then just the, you know, the crossing of paths and the development and the input that people, you know, gave to the sport. And it's just incredible. And again, I go back to Jim Palmieri and um, just what a dear friend. We're still in touch with him today. And, uh, you know, always plug and love that, you know, he wrote this book, you know, the chain of events and just what great insight and input, again, it, the history of it. Um, you know, it's a great, um, great book. And again, love the guy. And I think I, yeah, I showed you our American flying disc open and that they, you know, honored him with the, you know, this, this disc and here's all my Rochester Frisbee club gang and why. Yeah. So this is my year from those days. So yeah, I, I definitely appreciate it. And, um, yeah, just, Thank the Lord, yeah, for for all that. And well, it's, <laughs> I really like what you're saying too. You you've brought this up several times. Is um the season that season of life, and there's you know, and you just like one of the things that I've thought of while you were speaking is that you know, like one of the things that folks don't realize is is when you're in a group of friends like you're talking about, you know, like you not you might not realize until that group has followed ever how many paths there are per person down in those directions and you woke you're standing there and you're going wow what a great group of friends we had right there you know and and we still have them but they're you know children pulled children in england pulled you guys in a direction and and you know all these other things that happen in life you know you put you in a situation to wait for that next time your path is going to cross with those people and and but, the ongoing tournaments, you know, did, you know, have our pass cross because in 84, we lived in, uh, we lived in, let's see, no, 94, we lived in Atlanta. And so here comes the Masters tournament. And it's like, okay, I'll go to that. And I saw Tom and Rose, saw Stork, he had them over to our house and some other gang that we hadn't seen in years. And so I was able to play the golf event. I have a picture of taking home my kids to that park because it was way downtown Atlanta. We're again in Snellville, a little outside community and got to play, but Tina Booth won, won the golf and it got down to her and I in a playoff. And so, wow. it, yeah, need to, okay. So played in a decade in the eighties, got to play once in the nineties, moved to Raleigh in the two thousands. And I hear about, Oh, this tournament outside of um, Kentwood. It's outside uh, North Carolina state um tournament or near their campus and there's some so i don't know who sponsored it was it the um what was it? it wasn't seniors but anyway some little tournament so i said oh i'll go play i haven't played that in forever but took third but just had fun and met you know a few new people in the raleigh area then come to find out how big this area golf oh movie. yeah it's a monster oh. Is that Capital this? Area this league, you know, and, and Jay Pontier is doing a great job and we're going to host the Tim Selinski Masters. So I will wow. get up and get ready for that tournament, but probably won't do much travel before that. Just what I can do locally. When is and that? So, when are y'all hosting the Selinski? Slin is it this um, year? This year um, in Raleigh, we'll host it. And it's, uh, I think the third week of September, like the 21st or the 24th. Here in oh, Rock here's another reason to make that that Rock Hill trip longer for me. He, Just like last year for the Women's sure. Nationals. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So wow. that's coming up again. You know, I, just to, again to see old friends. We know there'll be a ton of people that we knew from way back haven't seen. Oh, so for sure. A, yeah, absolutely. There'll be so many people that are surprised and happy to see you too. And you're like, wait, I've been looking. I've been waiting for our paths to cross. And it's our backyard. And that's why, you know, when I found out this other women's world championships in Burlington, it's like, oh, I can't not do it. It's so close. And that's when I called Tina. I said, Tina, come stay with me. We'll go do this tournament. And she said, you know what this is? It's a world. It's a it's a major. And it's like, oh, OK. Well, let's <laughs> that was she, just like that simple little tournament in Helsingburg. You know, we'll just yeah, go over there oh, OK, let's go. You know, so. Yeah, so, that was such a great encounter with her and Flagstaff, you know, and I'm sure I've already spoke about this before, but, you know, I was like, Hey, I, I really want to have you. We really want to have you on our show. And that's oh. part of why I came here. The big reason why I came to Flagstaff was to run into you again. And she goes, come outside with me for a second and took me out to the lobby. And she told me about the whole pioneer women thing. And I was just like, 
she's like, would you be interested in interviewing us? And I was like, we absolutely would be interested. I'm not sure how that looks or what that's going to be, but I mean, mm -hmm. this still for me, it still stands as one of my favorite episodes. And it really was just a matter of like, I walked into that room when you guys were signing autographs and Susie says, do you know Chris Brophy? I was like, hold on one second. I was like, I'm just going to let this go. And introduce everybody. And, and, that was, so cool. and all y'all told your stories. And it was it was just amazing. You know, it was one of the best 45 minutes of the Good Times Hour so far, in my opinion. And and it was because you were just telling great stories from the heart, you know, and just those the fond way, memories. Way back, the way back time. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was a great event. Enjoyed it. And again, to reacquaint with um, all those ladies and then after that, I went down to Florida and I got Murray Murphy and brought her her little goodie bag because she couldn't make that event because um, of health reasons, but um, got to spend time and reacquaint with Marie. So nice. yeah, great. So we're, you know, we, we've had you here going on with some great stories and really contributing to the, the lore of knowledge. And certainly the Frisbee world is enriched to have you back in the fold, as it were and to have you back playing. And I just want to ask you about what your perceptions were of the USW DTC. You show up, you think it's a, you know, this little tournament, Tita has to tell you it's a big major, <laughs> but you show up there and there's 400 women in the room and, you know, they're hanging on every word you have to say. Uh, it was an incredible experience, again, to see the um, involvement and, and uh, the level of play and um, having met the local ladies the previous year and Patty Adams who won the um, 70 um, amateur and, and being able to play locally with some of these women in because uh, there is a triangle women's you know Facebook page and so everybody keeps informed of hey we're going to play here and that and um, again just to connect with new friends but you know just see the expansion of this sport and how, I don't know, the, the, the sponsorships that they get and, and, and the media presentation and that's there to, to take this sport, it's global. It, it's just astounding. And um, again, to meet new people, I met Jen Allen and had never met her before. Um, got to meet Sylvia Volks and had never met her before. And um, I can't wait because this is the year I can join the gold, is it the Golden Gals? Golden, they have seven golden girls, golden gals. Yeah. So I get to join another big group of ladies and meet them all. Hopefully, a lot of them will be here in September for um, the Tim Selinski Masters. And so, yeah, yeah, just another opportunity to meet people and, you know, just uh, have that. Well, it's definitely going to, I mean, there's, there's no lack of great folks in your area to run a great event. So I'm sure that that Selinski will be another one that's just off the charts. And that, that was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of history with Sarah Nicholson. So it was really cool to be there for that part of the event as well. And, you know, just to see her get her, you know, what she deserves, the recognition that she deserves for the efforts that she's put in over the years. And, and, but also just, you know, like I go back to the early nineties, like I said, and I'm my friend, I found all of this from my friend, Marie Gotcher in a, in a, sculpture class in college i walked in and and uh, i looked at the three tables and they were all i was in my early early to mid 20s and i was looking at all these folks that are like our ages you know just combined generally speaking and i was like i don't want to sit with those old people i don't want to sit with those old people i don't want to sit with the, you know what nobody's sitting right here and so i just put my books on this bench mm -hmm. and the next thing you know I, back then i smoked cigarettes so i went outside had a cigarette i came back in and the only people in the class that were my age were three young ladies at that table that had already put their books on stools I couldn't see. And after, as it turns out, my friend Marie introduced me to her husband. He introduced me to disc golf and hockey, two of my favorite spectator and participant sports, although I haven't ever played hockey. But mm -hmm. it led to all of this. You know, I mean, like, I was already working in the entertainment business and the lighting part of my life is still continued to grow as well. But I found all these friends through and all of y'all through one particular friend that I met in college. And, you know, it's the same thing again, the path cross in the right time. And then, Oh wait, I think I'll walk down this path with you for a little bit and see what, you know, see what I find. And, mm -hmm. and so that there's just so much of that. And especially 
over all the years, you know, from like 95 on for me, from my first major mm -hmm. and folks in your, right in your backyard, so many good friends that I met back then that are in your neighborhood now. And, and it's, yeah, it's great. It's really amazing. It is. And then again, now what, you know, Facebook and, and media outlets like this zoom and, and being able to connect everybody and, you know, record these interviews, you know, and it's, it's, it's great. And I thank you for what you guys are doing to, you know, to keep the history alive and, and known. So. Well, well we're both just storytellers. We can't, we're just suckers <laughs> for another great story. I think we're just we're we're long yappers. We're not story. We don't got no story to tell. We just we just know how to take words and string them along. But uh, we can't thank you enough for taking this time uh, to and uh, you know your energy and bringing the uh, the show and tell discs. Always great to see all of us were frisbee freaks at the core. So anytime the lid is lifted up, we go. We always lean in a little closer. What is this all about? There it is, right there. And uh, yeah, seventy five. I can't believe I still have it, but. I was going to do what Tita was going to do is try to make a quilt. So she took all her t-shirts and, and make the quilt. So, but some, I just can't cut up. So no, keep that that's understandable. Through. That's totally understandable. I, you know, I said this during the rehearsal earlier and I'm going to say it again. Your grandkids have no idea how cool it is that their grandma and their grandpa are teaching them Frisbee because that's like, it's just, man, it's so cool to hear these stories from the beginning, you know, and y'all were right there on the ground floor when the first one came out, you know, and, 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 um, you know, found it, found your way to it the natural way. And it's just awesome. It's amazing. And then that's, you know, again, we're, you know, my mom, I'm going to go visit her at 95. She's still doing great. And just the interaction being, you know, having mom and, and family there, but yet now having grandkids and pouring into them, that's what's important to us right now is our family, you know, and then just having, a, you know, a great faith, family, and friends. So that's you know. And add a little Frisbee and you got uh, fourfold perfection. <laughs> Fun. The fun's in there too. Well, thank you again, uh, Michelle. We really appreciate it. And we do want to arrange with Dave to have him on the show when he has a chance. Oh, you'll get yeah, great history of the Freestyle Players Association. That's so, yeah, well, and that's just it's more and more. The more we're talking to folks from your era, the more the more it's just unavoidable to realize that that's super important. Mm -hmm. You know, that that that's just as important as any other as, you know, the invention of the bevel disc, the beveled edge disc and all this other stuff. I mean, the evolution happened because of all those different things. So. Amen. And um, yeah, he, David was inducted. I thought I had his little mini, but um, as he was inducted into the Freestyle Hall of Fame and, you know, well-deserved again, because he helped develop one of the, the judging criteria. And again, this Independent Players Association, which was one of, I think the first indep Independent Players Association. Um, to now let the players have the input and run, you know, run their events and stuff. So again, big part. Oh, here it is. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. Yeah. You had to get a shirtless photo too, eh? Yeah. So <laughs> they uh, had done this in his induction and in that for, so he had gotten, yeah, that. Well, he's still looking good 40, 45 years later. Uh, <laughs> oh. you're, you're looking great. And, you know, we just, we're, we're so thankful that, uh, you know, we're in the same orbit. Yeah, so, thank you so much. Thanks again for being on the Good Times Hour. All right. God bless yeah, you guys. without a doubt. Thanks for stopping by. And uh, look forward to, well, if nothing else, we'll see you in September. Okay. Wonderful. In, in person. Sounds great. You got thank it. You. Thank you so much.